Good morning and welcome to your online digital worship for Trinity United Church of Christ in Canton, Ohio for Sunday, September 19th, 2021. We are so glad that you have gathered together wherever you may be to join us in this worship experience online. We are continuing to have three more weeks of services outside at Trinity in the parking lot. We have three more weeks of that at 1030 in the morning. And then on October 10th, 1010, at 10 a.m., we are going to have our first worship service back inside our rejuvenated, renovated building. We look forward to having as many people as possible at that service. We're going to be celebrating our 150th anniversary. We're going to have Reverend Dr. Paul Kiewit, our pastor emeritus, is going to be bringing the word, providing the sermon that day at 98 and a half years young. And he was there 50 years ago as the senior pastor at this church when they celebrated the centennial and never dreamed that he would be able to be preaching 50 years later. So please come on to that very special Sunday on October 10th at 10 a.m. inside our sanctuary. A couple of other announcements are that we are still looking for volunteers and we invite you all to sign up for the Fall Fest and 5K on Saturday, September 25th. Then our pet blessing on October 3rd will be after the worship. Pastor Nick will be blessing all of our pets in the style of St. Francis, in honor of St. Francis of Assisi. We also have a family movie night on October 16th at 5.30 p.m. and an all-church cleanup the week before on October 2nd at 10 a.m. We'd love to gather and help clean up the outside of our building. We're looking for many volunteers for that day. Plus, we also have our Habitat for Humanity build, so sign up for that. The next build day is also the 25th of September, so come on out early in the morning for that. Sign up online. We've got a lot going on in the life of the church at Trinity this fall. And of course, we are called to be the hands and feet of Christ, so we are looking for food donations for food insecure folks, for people who need a little help, and that is, doesn't get much more biblical than that, than feeding people in need. So please do so. Help us with the Yutz community. The Magistrates Elementary School community is looking for food donations to help fill their food pantry. You can do so by bringing those to the church, dropping them off at door one, or bringing them inside. There's three shopping carts right in our entrance that are accepting food donations right now. And if you are unable to donate food, you can also send in money and donations to, that we can use to purchase food to Trinity right here. So we thank you all for your support, your ongoing support in these most unusual times for our community in Christ at Trinity. Now let us turn our hearts, our minds, our souls to the very purpose that we have gathered here today to worship God. Here's our call to worship this morning. Jesus offers us a new old commandment that we should love each other. God, help us to do so. With the incredible power and the unfathomable depth of God's love for us, we can, we must love one another. God, help us to do so. And it is in this, our love for one another, that the world will know whom and what we worship. God, help us to do so. Come, children of God, let us love one another. God, help us to do so. Amen. Here is our prayer of intercession this morning. Holy God, before time you named us, through time you redeemed us. You call us precious in your sight. Holy One, through the turbulent waters, make us steady. Your hands holding strong the fragile and the weak. Gracious God, may the fruits of our lives be food for the hungry, bread, clothing, shelter, fire, water, word. We pray all these things in Christ's precious and powerful name. Amen. Our scripture this morning comes from 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 to 21. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the parent loves the child. By this we know that we love the children of God, 
when we love God and obey his commandments. For the love of God is this, that we obey his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God conquers the world, and this is the victory that conquers the world, our faith. Who is it that conquers the world but the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not with the water only, but with the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one that testifies, for the Spirit is the truth. There are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood. And these three agree. If we receive human testimony, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God that he has testified to his Son. Those who believe in the Son of God have the testimony in their hearts. Those who do not believe in God have made him a liar by not believing in the testimony that God has given concerning his Son. And this is the testimony. God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the boldness we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have obtained the requests made of him. If you see your brother or sister committing what is not a mortal sin, you will ask, and God will give life to such a one, to those whose sin is not mortal. There is sin that is mortal. I do not say that you should pray about that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin that is not mortal. We know that those who are born of God do not sin, but the one who was born of God protects them, and the evil one does not touch them. We know that we are God's children and that the whole world lies under the power of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please join me in the spirit of prayer. Gracious Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This morning, we have our 14th sermon in the sermon series, Peter and John. And it's the fifth and final sermon from 1 John. Over the next two Sundays, we will be looking at the even lesser known books of the Bible, 2 John and 3 John. And then we shall wrap up our series. As we have been talking throughout this series, the letter of 1 John is focused on love, and this is where we shall end it and leave it today. It begins with love, and it ends with love. Love is the be-all and end-all of Jesus' message. That's what 1 John tells us. For Jesus came to this world to free us from sin and death. He walked through our pain. He weeped at the side of Martha and Mary over the seeming death of his friend Lazarus. He walked with us and suffered with us and showed radical, compassionate love in all that he did, in word and deed. That's the gospel message summed up and presented to us in 1 John. And now 1 John goes on to tell us how we are to respond to that love in our lives by loving our neighbors, and by finding common ground, connection, and humanity with all of them, even and especially when it is hard. And out of this love that he first showed us by coming into the world as the Word made flesh, showing us a new way, out of this love we are to respond. And how was this love enacted? It was enacted in this way, First John tells us. It was enacted through the new commandment. The new commandment. It is enacted in this way by Jesus, 
It is summed up by Jesus in the gospel and enacted in John's gospel and reminded in 1 John. There is a repetition here, as you can see, as we have talked about. The repetition of this message is so important throughout the scriptures because we need to hear it so many times to let it sink in and then to actually live it out and act through that love. Because this is what Jesus did in his ministry. This is how he showed that love. Just a couple examples. He healed the lame. He fed the 5,000. He spared the woman caught in adultery. He raised Lazarus from the dead. And after all of this, after all of the years of his ministry and his miracles, at the climax of the gospel story, at the Last Supper, Jesus leaves them with one commandment, and the most important one, little children, love one another as I have loved you. That's the climax of the story. After he showed them what this love looks like, then he tells them that they need to do it as he has done, loved them because he was leaving this earth. This is said in the 13th chapter of John's Gospel, and it is repeated and expounded upon here in 1 John chapter 5. How do we love one another in this difficult and divided time? In our current hyper-partisan and hyper-divided nation, I firmly believe that one of the best ways to bridge the divide and love one another is through interpersonal interactions, through telling and listening to one another's stories. There are many organizations out there collecting stories and promoting this. But when I was reading the Bible commentaries on 1 John chapter 5, I came across a reference to one of my favorite projects, the StoryCorps project. I was first introduced to StoryCorps on a very dark and miserably freezing cold January day in Boston, Massachusetts. It was January 2010, and I was teaching seventh grade geography as my first job after graduate school. I was living in Jamaica Plain, in the Jamaica Plain neighborhood in Boston, and I was commuting an hour south to the suburban town of Franklin, Massachusetts. I had to be at school early. Homeroom started at 7.10, Teachers needed to arrive at 6.45 in the morning. And so you can do the math to see what hour I had to start driving to Franklin when I had an hour commute in the morning. Sarah and I had her parents' 20-year-old Volvo station wagon as our car, and the heater had broken. Without time or money to fix it right away, I ended up driving with a broken heater at 5.30 in the, mar in the morning, in the freezing cold, in the dark, on the way to teach school, I found myself driving this 20-year-old Volvo with gloves on inside of the car, with my breath freezing icicles onto the inside of the windshield. It was pretty miserable, that cold January morning in 2010. But I was listening to the radio. And for the first time, I heard a program called StoryCorps. It was an initiative where family members or friends were given the task of recording interviews with loved ones, usually older grandparents, parents, former teachers, people in their community, often family members. They were gathering the stories of our nation one person at a time. I listened to the story that morning. That morning, I don't remember exactly what the story was, but I'm pretty sure it was a former student interviewing a teacher about the lessons they had learned, about the importance and the impact that teacher had had on that student's life. And it touched me to the core as I was driving to teach some seventh graders about geography. That moment gave me hope. It snapped me out of my own self-absorbed misery and reminded me of the purpose of what I was doing the importance of teachers in this world. And it was just the voice, the intimately connected voice of two people who knew each other, who loved each other, who respected each other, blasting out over the airwaves that gave me hope for humanity. If you go onto the StoryCorps website, this is their mission. StoryCorps reminds the nation that every story matters and every voice counts. Since 2003, StoryCorps has given a quarter of a million Americans the chance to record interviews about their lives, to pass wisdom from one generation to the next, and to leave a legacy for the future. 
It is the single largest collection of human voices ever gathered. These powerful stories illustrate our shared humanity and show how much more we share in common than what divides us. StoryCorps has continued to this day, and now they have animated versions of their stories online, audio archives, and they've created more specific focuses for their stories, including bridging divides, gathering stories for those suffering from memory loss while they can still tell them, and bringing people together across racial and political divides. As I said, I don't remember all the details of that story, fateful story in January of 2010 in the freezing dark on my way to teach in Massachusetts. But I do remember that it was so personal, poignant, and filled with love, and it was so tender that I cried freezing tears down my face for the last 10 minutes of my commute that day. But it was tears of love, of relief, of joy, recognizing that there was power in this project, the power of story, the power of connection, the power of uniting our nation and world through our basic humanity. That's what I heard that morning. Now, I had not thought about that day for years until just this week when I was preparing for the sermon and I found the reference, a reference, to a StoryCorps interview with Peter Schultes by his daughter-in-law, Jenna Kasborough Hansen. She interviewed her stepfather in June of 2005 when he was 68 years old and just four years before his passing. Peter Schultes was a Catholic priest on the south side of Chicago in the 1960s and is most famously known as the composer of the hymn, They Will Know We Are Christians By Our Love. He wrote it in 1965 in the middle of the tumult of the civil rights movement. Now he did leave the priesthood years later and became a business consultant and authored multiple books on business leadership getting married and having a family. But in 1965, he was a white priest at St. Brendan's Parish, half black and half Irish. And he lived out the call to love your neighbors through his actions in the middle of that time as a Catholic priest on the south side of Chicago. When Dr. Martin Luther King first came north on a speaking tour and organizing missions, Father Schultes welcomed him to St. Brendan's Parish, which did not go over well with the white members of his church. Dr. King had a rally in a park across the street from the parish when he first came north, and Father Peter hung a sign above the front of the church saying, St. Brendan's welcomes Dr. Martin Luther King. The sign offended some folks who were unhappy with what he did and who left the parish. Yet following in Christ's footsteps and believing in the message of love for all Christians equally, he got involved in the civil rights movement and walked on marches with Dr. King and Jesse Jackson. He was involved in negotiations to allow the High Low Food Store Company to do business with the black community who had, not, who had been blocked out of many business arrangements all across Chicago and throughout this nation. Listening to Jesus' call, he worked with Dr. King to allow African Americans to participate in the economy like everyone else. He offered basic food security through High Low Foods in an operation called Operation Breadbasket. If you don't think of the feeding of the 5,000 of the miracle when you hear that story, take a moment and reflect. After some Time working with the movement, Father Peter invited Dr. King to speak at the parish. And much to Father Peter's surprise, he came alone. His first words when he got out of the car without an entourage, without security, were, could I have a cup of coffee? I heard this story, listening to the story core interview recorded in 2005. It's touching and beautiful. So... Father Peter took him down to the parish kitchen and asked the women who were preparing refreshments for coffee hour if Dr. Martin Luther King could have a cup of coffee. He walked in and Peter said, Hi, there is someone here who I think you would like to meet. As he tells it, their eyes got wide as saucers, their jaws dropped, and they were in awe that Martin Luther King had just walked in 
And they certainly scrambled around to get him a cup of coffee. Peter Schultes penned the hymn. They will know we are Christians by our love in the middle of this environment, of those experiences, of trying to show love to the black community that was shut out of the business world, that was being oppressed, that was segregated. I firmly believe that this, his actions, his work, were certainly the way of Christ, were certainly the way of love, and the way of love, even when it is hard, even in the midst of people being upset and protesting and walking away from the church. But he did not walk away from the gospel. It was in this context, living out the message from 1 John chapter 5, that Father Peter, reflecting on what it means to be a Christian, on how to show what it means to be a Christian, penned the words of that famous hymn. And now that hymn has gone all around the world. In this interview, he also told a hilarious story that years later, he was fostering a child, his foster daughter named Abby. Abby was from Ethiopia. And one day, his mother-in-law was humming the tune. They will know we are Christians by our love. And she recognized it. And she said, hey, we used to sing that hymn back in Ethiopia. In Adidas Ababa, where she was from, the capital of Ethiopia. She said, it's an Ethiopian hymn. And she knew it in her native language of Amharic. Amharic. How amazing. Christians in Ethiopia, in their language, were singing his tune. And she said, no, his mother-in-law said, no, no. That's not from Ethiopia. It's an English-speaking hymn. And it was written by Peter right here in this house. She didn't believe, of course. And so his mother-in-law went and grabbed a Hallmark card that they had saved. The Hallmark card, which had the words to the hymn and had written on a byline, Peter Schultes, right there. Their foster daughter was shocked, but then she believed that this indeed was written in that house right there. This just goes to show the universality of this hymn, the importance of love, the spread, the global spread of Christianity, and the diversity of our Christian family. And all of that was contained in this wonderful story core interview. For the love of God is this, that we obey his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome, for whatever is born of God conquers the world. And this is the victory that conquers the world, our faith. Who is it that conquers the world but the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Our faith, our love can conquer this world. And by conquer, I mean that can heal this broken world, that can bring people together, that can stop the division and the hatred and the forces that would drive us apart. That's how faith through love can conquer this world. And I believe it is the stories that connect us. Loving our sisters and brothers, the family of Christ together. And that is what we will continue to be hearing over this next year. As we continue to celebrate our 150th anniversary. In just a couple weeks, our Pastor Emeritus, Reverend Dr. Paul Kiewit, will be preaching and telling us some of his story. The story of our church. His story that is integral to our 150th anniversary. So please come out and hear that. And we'll be celebrating more stories from our church on November 21st at another celebration for 150 years. These are your stories, Trinity. The stories and shared history of humanity and love that we have right here in our community. These stories, our stories, have the power to heal, to create love, to show that love conquers all, that faith conquers the world, that love conquers hate. These stories, one by one, person by person, can help overcome the fear and division and the backlash that we are seeing right now in this world, in this nation, this backlash to living in love, to loving one another. For First John is full of warnings of false prophets. While it talks about love, it also gives these warnings of false prophets, of those who are of the world, of those who would tear us apart, of those who would sow division and hatred and not the path of love. And even some of those people may do so in Christ's name. That's what 1 John warned people of 2,000 years ago. That warning seems pretty appropriate today. If we are worried and fearful, we are not walking the path of love. For as we heard last week, perfect love casts out all fear. 
But have no fear, little children. If we have received, if we receive human testimony, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God that he has testified to his son. Those who believe in the Son of God have this testimony at their hearts. And this is the testimony. And God gave us eternal life, and the life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Let us walk in love and not be afraid. Amen. And now we are called to give a portion of the gifts that God so freely gives to us all back to the mission and ministries of this church. You can give by clicking on the link online. You can give by mailing checks into the church by dropping them off at the drop box out front, bringing them into the office, which is open. However you give, we say thank you, thank you, thank you. Your tithes and offerings allow us to spread this gospel of love, the gospel of Christ, everywhere that we go. Thank you for your support. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May you go forth this week remembering that God is love, that we are to love others because he loved us first. May we go forth in faith knowing that our faith and our love can conquer the divisions and fear in this world. I pray these things may be so in our hearts. Amen.